Hey, uh, I was starting this this more or this evening. Uh, uh, I told the pastor just a few minutes ago, this is the beginning of a bad joke. I have uh, a pastor, I have a professor, I have a counselor, and sometimes someone who acts like a chaplain. So we've got this part going. And uh, we're in the Beatitudes, uh, Matthew chapter five, uh, very popular, uh, uh, very exciting to uh, preach through very exciting to teach through, very exciting to counsel through uh, as well. Uh, Pastor, uh, this morning, give us a broad stroke. Where, where were we going? We covered uh, almost uh, 20 some scriptures this morning, plus Galatians chapter five. Uh, what was in the stroke of, of bringing this message forward? Well, to begin with, is in the book I'm preaching, so I mean, it was the next thing uh -huh. in expository preaching. It's the antithesis. Uh, there are six antitheses in the, in the passage before us, and it's the, you've heard it said, and, and this is not rabbinical teaching, it's, it's from, the, from the law. Right. And so Jesus is giving us the greater righteousness, and he is the only one who can fulfill the greater righteousness. And so the point was, okay, if Jesus is the fulfillment of the greater righteousness, then how do these antitheses instruct me in my ethics as a, as a Christian? Well, obviously, again, I can't, I can't become a Christian by keeping these. I don't believe that I'm sanctified by keeping these. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a moment. So what purpose do they serve? And again, I think they serve a purpose in showing us the characteristics of the kingdom and characteristics of kingdom people. And that's why I took it to Galatians 5, where he says, I started out with 5.14, the, the foundation of the law is love. We know that uh, the, the Jesus gave us a commandment. He said, I want you to, this is a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you. And so I think as you look at the antitheses and, and you see how the letter of the law is, is now coupled with the spirit of the law or the intention of the law, coupled with the person who exemplifies both letter and spirit, then we get an idea of what the kingdom itself is like because we get an idea of what the king is like. Okay. As you, as you looked at the scripture, and I always ask you this each, each week, each week, and you started to say something in your sermon, uh, what did you discover a new, or something that just stood out at you and said, wow, I, I've not seen this, or it's not presenting itself this way to me before. Well, as I come from a New Covenant perspective, I, this, this sermon is fascinating to me because I think it's been misunderstood and misapplied for years. But in, in studying it this time, it's pretty much consistent with, with other studies in the recent past, except for the, when he talks about loving our enemies and how that God exemplifies loving your enemies by sending rain on the just and the unjust alike. Is that verse 45? Uh, I think it is. Let's see here. Yeah, it's verse 45. Uh, for he causes his son or his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay. And so again, God is the exemplification of what he, what he says in these six things. Okay, all right. Uh, bro brother, brother Ken, what jumped out to you this morning as you were looking at that sermon, as you were studying? Well, and it was a fantastic sermon, by the oh, way. We, we uh, have my sermon notes here and, and the family as we were listening and watching and we would actually even, you know, benefit sometimes of being home, pause, and, and what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you and how we're able to do that? And where the thing that we kind of took was that as fallen man, we seem to think that at times there's boxes that we can check off and we are fulfilling the law or what we're supposed to do as, as, as Christians and how that's, that's man, that's fleshly man and that's not divine. And so as wife and kids and I were sitting there talking, we started uh, examining ourselves and we, we kind of 
talked a little bit and said, you know, this isn't, um, there aren't scales that, that and, and people seem to at times think that's the way. It's scales of justice, you know, they have to be equal. There is no, there is no scale. If there was, we would, we would never measure up to what we're called to do and especially when you look at the things that, uh, I mean, we could all probably say, well, yeah, murder, that's not me, but lust or envy or great, some of the other aspects of this, they really speak to us. And as people and as fallen Christians, we tend to migrate towards those things that are, are not of the spirit, but are of the flesh. And so for us, this morning, that was a great discussion that we were able to have with our family, again about the 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 flesh and what our flesh pulls us to do, which is wrong, versus the spirit and the spirit of the law, which has called us to be Christ-like. Okay, brother Dean. Well, uh, for years, uh, I tended to operate under the notion that it was a blueprint for Christian living. Okay. Right? And uh, a lot of people seem to think that. I, yes. I, I would suggest a majority. And, um, uh, but, but I've come to realize that it's really a demolition derby. Okay? It, it's, it's Christ's exercise of demolishing any notion of wiggle room in terms of being reconciled to God because there isn't any. So we, we like to find little places that we can maybe achieve something so that when we go to bed at night, we, we, we don't have to pray, oh Lord, give me some reason to add something to my salvation. So in this particular sermon, on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, right, mm -hmm. he demolishes all of that. Okay. And, uh, and so, and so when, it, when it comes down to the application of it, all right, I, I would approach it like this. Reading this, what then necessarily makes Jesus necessary? See, what makes Jesus necessary in my life? What, what compels or drives anyone to Christ? Right? Okay. Well, it's fundamentally desperation, I would suggest, mm -hmm. when I read this, and it, it helps me to recognize and understand, there isn't any wiggle room. I, I, I can't, um, th there's nothing I can do, so what, and, and that's why I think the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' greatest law preaching ever, because that's, remember, remember the audience, what's the point, the purpose of why he's doing it, which ultimately led me to see it's not a blueprint for Christian living, because um, it, it's the greatest sermon of, of discouragement ever if you leave out Jesus' necessity, right? But that's in actuality what he lived under and what the disciples and those to whom he's speaking lived under. So do you take the, uh, the, the script, that part that says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the, of the Pharisees, is that, is that discouraging as you hear that played out with the disciples? Is that the part? Yes. Well, if I had Jewish ears and I was listening mm -hmm. to that, it would certainly incredibly discourage me. Okay. Because I need someone who's gentle and lowly, who Christ is in Matthew eleven twenty eight. So I, I, I desperately need that. So th the sermon is to cut out any notion of self-salvation efforts. It's to cut out any idea that there's anything that I can do. Uh, and, you know, and there's some scholars who would approach it from the perspective of hyperbole, and I don't think it is. I think it's actual. I don't think be perfect as your Father in Heaven is hyperbole to make a point. I think it's true. I said that in the sermon. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, right. it, I said exactly that. Um, and, and which, 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 again, if you can find any wiggle room in that, that, that gives me credit for anything, I'd, I'd like to know where that necessarily is. But, but the fact is, and I used to tell my counselees, mm -hmm. and I still do, here's God's requirement for us to be reconciled and have a relationship with Him. Ready? Okay. Every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year, right? With no days off and no breaks. No holidays. We are to love God with a heart, soul, mind, and strength, and as a neighbor of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's, that's the requirement. Okay? So when I hear that in its full totality, that, that tends to sense, create in me a sense of great discouragement and desperation because I, I just can't do that. So, 
it, it's, it's, a, it's a place where Jesus is trying to compel or help them understand that the law can't do what the law requires and that he's available. Do you want to say something, Pastor? Well, I totally I agree with everything he said. I, I think the law, Paul makes this case, the law doesn't save anyone. We said that this morning. Salvation comes through an exchange, a double exchange. I receive his righteousness, which is the greater righteousness. He takes on my sin, which is grace. So I, I certainly see that in, in one aspect of this that your take is exactly right. I, I don't have a problem with your take at all. Where would you see the application from your perspective? The application from my perspective, okay, first of all, it would be your application okay. that, that I need Christ and Christ alone. It, I can't have any system, whether it be Judaism or Catholicism or Islam or any system that says, Kenny, you have got to be righteous in order to earn acceptance with God. Because his righteousness is to total. It's, it's, it's holiness. So yes. I can't make it. I can't make it. So I think that he is saying to them, your righteousness is, is spiritual bankruptcy. You are spiritually bankrupt. I think that's, I think that's there. I think, too, though, when, when, we as a believe, when we as believers, and you asked this the other day, and, and I, I didn't think about this until this week. The Luke 6 parallel, when you ask, okay, who's the audience? Yes. The, the parallel in Luke 6 says this, and turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, right. blessed to you. So that's the parallel. I, I think it's mainly to the disciples, certainly to the crowds. I don't think the... I don't think the scribes and Pharisees by far and large ever got it. I think they kept right on with their plan to please God. But I think there is also another application in that it does not set rules for my Christian life. It does not do any of that. But there are entailments to my Christian life, which I see in Galatians 5, where, you know, you have 14, but then you have the context of it, which says don't fulfill the the fruits of the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. And I think when I look at the entailments of the Christian life, which are necessary results or consequences of being born again, I think that I am instructed, instructed, mind you, from what I see in the Sermon on the Mount as far as kingdom righteousness. Again, I'm not trying to live up to kingdom righteousness, but I am instructed, and I think Paul... And this is another thought I had, and I don't mean to take too much time. But Pastor, it's your, it's your church. <laughs> well, it's God's church. It's Christ's church. It's not mine, but I, you know. You're pastor. I, I, did, I, did, I did preach the sermon this morning. Yeah. Um, you know, Paul, I thought about this. And you guys weigh in. But when Paul went and conferred with the disciples in Jerusalem, I don't think he was asking them, you know, architecturally speaking, do you think we should build churches in the shape of crosses? or shotgun buildings or, you know, should we make it easy to pass the plate? I think he wanted to know about Jesus. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus teach? And I think the Holy Spirit taught him that as well. So that when Paul tells us in the entailments of the Christian life, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in Galatians, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and every book that he writes, I think it can go back to kingdom ethics. I, th I think this is a picture of kingdom ethics. Say that again, Pastor. I think it's a picture of kingdom, a portrait of kingdom ethics. Not a snapshot, okay. but a portrait. Portrait. Okay. Brother Ken, you, 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 you want to add anything to that? I saw you. Well, I'm not sure. Um, uh, Kenny, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. And um, again, as we were talking earlier about this particular section and talking about Paul, and why this speaks to us, and, and this kind of, as a psychologist, we kind of look at behavior a lot, where Paul said, why is it, I'm paraphrasing, why is it I do the things that I hate? And I'm, I'm you know, if, uh, that he's um, drawn to that, the earthly being that he is, he's drawn to do those things, and to be those things that he knows he should not and does not want to be. 
So recognizing that behavior um, and, and kind of to take Kenny a part of, of what you said about the ethics, when we look at ethics, when we look at someone like Paul, we'd say, all right, uh, with, within ethics, there are standards and principles. What do you stand for and what is your discipline? And Paul's just saying the things that I stand for and the discipline that I seek, I cannot, I have not made, but I'm drawn to that. So for me, within this, and as Christ was talking to the disciplines, it's, I mean, to the disciplines, to the disciples, the apostles, it was almost, you, have got, you are going from milk to meat. And Paul was, had that same kind of experience of, I've got, to get, I've got to go from the earthly being to a more spiritual person, that that was the same experience that Christ was, when he was speaking to this, at this time to this group, it was a maturity. It was change in behavior to grow, to learn, to replicate and be a Christ-like and walk like Christ in the path that he was walking. That, that scripture and in Galatians, Galatians, just the whole book of Galatians, talks about, probably on 14 different occasions, talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, 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 I think we're, we're talking about something, yes, uh, that righteousness is, is very difficult. Uh, I don't think it's unattainable uh, now. Yeah. Yes. I think in heaven it Christ won't be, it won't be a Christ-like righteousness, <laughs> but it's not, it's not something that we should not be you shouldn't strive for. I mean, you still we should be for growing that. towards. Yeah. We should be. Well, it's the, actually, it's the starting point. It should be a, a, a growing part of our, our daily lives. And you ask a question in your sermon How do I know? How do I know that I am on the right path? How do I know that I am progressing in my relationship with the Lord? How do we know? Well, it's not by checking boxes and it's not by yeah. saying. Well, here's the Sermon on the Mount, and here's the antithesis, and I'm doing pretty good because I've kept at least half of it. That, that, that's, that's, that's the rich young ruler's because problem. Of, that, yeah, that's the rich young. That's we have starting a desire the, to know. That's, that, that's the wrong starting point. You say, you're saying this is at least the starting point. It's the wrong starting point to say, I'm going to measure up. I'd well, like to know what you're talking about. Christians point. start at the finish line. That's true. Christians start with righteousness. That's right. And sanctification is progressive expression. It's not, it's not becoming something. It's, 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 it's more or less learning to express that which we've already been granted. If we all died here today, we're perfectly fit for heaven. There's nothing added and subtracted. There's nothing added. No. Okay. So, so the question becomes, in what way do I live that out? What, what way is that expressed on a daily basis? And, and that's just living out every day and learning to express that which we already have. There's, okay. there's, there's nothing that I progressively become that I are, I'm already not. Sanctification is something that is a once-for-all reality that is progressively expressed as yes, we go through. Yes, but there the, is a growing in our relationship <laughs> and there's a growing in our faith. I think maybe the word would be discovery. Discovery? I, I, okay. I, I would suggest All that's right. more so appropriate. We, we, yeah. we, we discover. Yeah. Okay. But we still use the word <clears throat> We do, and we Growing. use it, and we, and, well, uh -huh. and, and, and Paul does too, uh -huh. but we use that in two senses. We use the word sanctification in two senses. Because sanctification, you, you can't sanctify yourself. No. Sanctif right. Sanctification means you are set apart. Well, somebody had to set you apart, and that was God. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't do that, but, but then there is. there is that process in which, again, I will concede and say, in which we discover what it means to be a Christian, and the more we discover about it, I think the more we are drawn to be more satisfied in Christ and more satisfied in, in who he is and how that plays out in our lives. Yes, and, and, and that, of course, I think comes through uh, uh, gazing more upon his glory. Second Corinthians. Right, yeah. so 318, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Which, which, which is, right, uh, a process uh, and, and really, uh, so 5, 6, Galatians 5, 6, faith working through love. Well, you have to start with faith. Well, faith in what? 
Christ. F f faith is all is believing all that God in Christ has done for me, not what I've got to do. Because if it's that, then that's why this this is a very discouraging passage if you don't understand what Jesus is trying to do with it, right? Because I I, I could walk away from hearing something like this and be the most discouraged guy on the planet because I can't do it. Now, well, I, what if you looked at it and said, okay, I, I understand that, but if you look at it as the greater righteousness. And, and, I don't and, see it as a greater righteousness. Well, Christ is a greater righteousness. I, I would suggest that it's been that way all the time. I, I, he, yeah. he himself says here that here's the greater righteousness. Your righteousness can't be like this. Your righteousness had to be like this. And, and, and again, you're saying that for us, humanly speaking, that's impossible. But right. it's not impossible for him. My only question is if, if I'm gazing at his glory, then when I see how he exemplifies all of this, I, to me that's even more encouraging as, his, as the recipient of his work. Kenny, I think one of the things you said earlier today that, um, and I'm surprised we didn't have a Beatles reference to it, when you <laughs> said it was love. It, 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 you know, it, this all comes back to love to love our neighbors, to love others as we, you know, would love ourselves, so even greater. And to me, when I read through this, if you read this with the lens of love, it reads, to me, it reads differently. It's very positive. Yeah, it's very encouraging. It is encouraging to me. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not, that's not saying it's not discouraging to other people. I, I think I'm the difference is, is if you read it as an entrance requirement, it's very discouraging. Oh, my. Yeah. If you, if you read it as what Christ has done, then it's a very encouraging. Well, how do you think they heard it? Oh, uh, well, that's I, a good question. I'm not, how do you th I know how they heard it. Well, I, don't, I won't claim that one, but I will say that they heard well, they it. They say it. So he tells them it, how they heard it. It, 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 it was probably difficult, uh, and it's all depending who was listening. I mean, to the, to the scribes and Pharisees, it probably irritated the mess out of them. Uh, how can to, anyone be saved then? That's how they heard it. How then can anyone be saved? And what did Christ say? With man it's impossible. With, with God all things are possible. Right. That's how they heard it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same way. That's why I say what makes Jesus necessary. And, and and what makes him necessary? To me, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the most provocative thing of what you're saying because what, Jesus, what makes Jesus necessary and not only necessary but exclusive. I mean, there is no other way. way. He is exclusive. I mean, he is, let's say, essential. Well, when I, I, I was reading through, uh, going through Hebrews again the other, other day, and um, just reading the first two chapters of Hebrews, kind of, and along there, Colossians 2, you see this incredible exclusivity about the fact that here's one whose very word holds the universe together. Now, last time I checked, I don't know of any other religious figure whose word holds the universe together or through whom God created all things and who is the exact nature of God. And I mean, you, you see those and so you realize and understand the, the profundity of that. Uh, so, he, and, and that's why the, he's necessary in that. He's the only one that can, that can meet the requirements. And, and to do that lovingly and sacrificially and even delightfully on some level. Yeah, uh, but 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 it's exclusive to him because he's the only one that could do that. Yeah, and not just because of his omniscience and omnipotence, but because of his holiness, because of his, for use it for lack of a better word, because of his moral perfection. I mean, he's the only one who could, who could, as the word writer he's, of Hebrews says, create access passive. exactly he's access to God because nobody else can do that. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's no doubt when this was, when, when, when Christ did this, it was radical. Yeah. And there were those within, the, within earshot that were probably, you know, oh, this is blasphemous. How dare he? Well, and, and I'm sorry. No, no, no. Not only was it radical then, but it's, it's, radical, it's radical now. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, natural man is natural man. Oh, right. oh, yes, because natural man and the world that we live in makes this radical stuff because the nature is to sin. Right. The natural man is religious, too. Likes rules. Likes rules. Likes, likes to think he's somehow worthy of God. I mean, it's almost like the military. Worthy I love of God. the military because it's the rules. Follow A, B, C, and you get this right here. I mean, it's just part of... of uh, 
a, a great life if you want to say it that way uh, the hard part is when there is no there's no rules well and, and that that inevitably is why the gospel is counterintuitive yes right. everything about it is counterintuitive because we're easily led down a pathway this is if I do this this and this then there's necessarily a positive yes. consequence at the end of it and so right so the gospel is so counterintuitive it's just, it's it's so uh, and that's in a sense what makes it glorious and that's why when you read first corinthians 2 right <clears throat> that's why no wisdom from man will get you to god it's just not going to happen right there's no wisdom on the planet just that wisdom. will get us to god right uh, but we have this legalistic and a license and in between them is what is this where we find liberty is this where we find the grace? See, I think there's a difference between, okay, Paul says in, in the Galatians 5 passage, okay. you're free. Well, free from what? Well, free from the law, okay? Also, he says you're, in Romans 6, you're free from sin. sin. Sin will not have dominion over you. There, there's a great deal of freedom as a Christian, but then he says, don't turn your liberty into license. I mean, that's I paraphrase there, of course, but... Don't, don't turn your freedom into the opportunity for, for sin. Shall we go on sinning? God forbid. May it never be. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's like Jerry Bridges described it like this. You, you have the gospel, and you have legalism on one. It's, it's like, okay, it's a roadbed, like you're going through the Everglades, and there's this roadbed, and it's, the, it's, it's grace, okay, because the gospel is the message of grace. It's grace. On one side, you've got the swamp of legalism on the other side of the swamp you got antinomianism and and the gospel is neither it's neither it is counterintuitive it's radical because it's god's grace by god's grace we are saved no, that's the gift of god. Mm -hmm. all right what else we need to cover on this Let's go through those six laws real quick. Or what is it, three laws? The sixth well, commandment, yeah, the there's... seventh commandment. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about a little bit of anger. Who wants to jump out there? I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I, I don't think we have the time. <laughs> oh, come on, guys. I, I think uh, Robin hadn't well, even stood I, up yet. I, th so I, I think uh, really as a pastor, and then I know these guys both deal with it from the psychological and counseling aspect. I don't wouldn't think ethics would be so much concerned with anger. Maybe it is. I'd like to hear what ethics has to say about anger, but, but I think anger is a major problem today. Uh, it, it's a major problem, not just in our culture, but in relationships. I mean, people carry their self-interest. If, if, you, if you come against my self-interest and you deprive me of my rights, I'm very angry. Angry. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, anger in and of itself, and I think you said this, Kenny, isn't necessarily terrible. People get angry. You, I think you even meant, you know, Christ got, got angry and, yeah, and, 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 and turned tables and others. So anger in and of itself is a natural emotion, along with being happy and sad and, and, and everything else. It's what we do and how we, how we um, manifest our anger. Is it through you know peaceful means or resolution, um, uh, meditation, prayer, forgiveness, or is it through you know um, an, an action that is meant to be hurtful? And that's you know I, th I think we were kidding earlier about retribution and, and things along those lines. Um, so I, anger, um, and I know you've you've had to deal a lot with this, and any any counselor has to deal with anger. Um, when I think about uh, what makes me angry, um, I have to also think about how, when I am angry, how I deal with that. And if there's anything that I would say if people need to hear something related to how to handle anger, it's the Word. Mm -hmm. Go back to the Word and, and find out, you know what, yes, that made me angry. Why did that make me angry? You know what? God calls me to still love that person, even though what they've done or what they've said or didn't do has made me angry. I'm still to love that person, and I'm called to love that person. And it's not easy. In fact, I'd say it's extremely hard in some regards, uh, very challenging. But 
you know, the anger can become a, a anchor and it can become a big uh, thing that we carry around with us. And when I teach, when I talk to kids, and we actually, kids as students, when we talk about emotions and we talk about anger and happiness, um, I'll have them do an exercise, which will be basically what makes you angry. Now, how do you release that anger? And for them to kind of go through and understand that. And the hard question that I'll ask them then is, who have you made angry? And once they start that self-reflection, they kind of start looking at forgiveness. Well, I sure hope, I know I made my dad angry when I did X, Y, Z. I sure hope my dad or my mom or whatever will forgive me for that. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say, getting back to the word is how I personally handle uh, anger. And it's, it's something that uh, unfortunately today in our society, um, and I think we talked about this once before, we talked about forgiveness, I'm right and you're wrong, and what you're doing is making me angry, and what I'm doing is making you angry, and we'll never get civil and come get between us. How wonderful, how great a world it would be if we all just came back to the wor word uh, to deal with our anger. Yeah. That's why we have laws, though, because we don't. That's why we have laws, yes, Brother Dan. Well, well, I was just going. Uh -huh. well, well, I was just going to say. Very interestingly enough, from a physiological perspective, the same response symptomatically in our bodies that occurred during the fight or flight are the same ones that occur during anger. Right. So there's a sense in which anger is a self-protective device. The distinction is the dialogue that accompanies the anger. It's the it's the meaning that I'm giving to the action that I'm interpreting. So. Um, Pretty much there's a dialogue around anger. You shouldn't have done that. You ought not do that. That was unjust. That was unfair. Uh, uh, Malintent, you know, there are things that necessarily contribute to that. But, but, but anger, if you will, is just sort of part of our response to things that are unjust and, un, and unrighteous and unfair. Right. Uh, but right anger has a right reason and a right expression. So right. it's the challenge and how that's necessarily manifested. Uh, that uh, it becomes a righteous anger. And um, uh, like, like anything, you know, fire can heat your food and it can burn down a forest. So it's, it's, it's just how that makes it. Uh, yeah, and, and without question, okay. without question, un, un, uh, unmitigated and uncontrolled anger is pretty much the demise of a society and a demise of relationships. It's, it's pretty much the, uh, it, it's such uh, the totality of it uh, and so it's, uh, it, it, it does us all well to consider and understand, um, you know, what, what, what it is that, that con contributes to our anger, which is a dialogue. Okay. Okay. It's a dialogue. It's not what someone does. It's the dialogue that we have meaning we give to it. In our own mind. In and our heart. own mind. Yeah. We, we, that, that belongs to us. Um, because if it didn't, then we don't have any control over it. So that would be a problem, too. Okay. So, so physiologically speaking, as you brought this up, and you have a medical background. As Supposedly. You're, you're a yes. man of many hats. Yes, sir. But, okay, with the fight or flight, the, ad the adrenaline rushes, but it's, it's used because you're, you're either fighting or you're, or you're running. But anger doesn't dissipate it, and so it's stored up. And I, I, my understanding is that's very harmful to your body physiologically. Mm. Physiologically. It is. It is. And um, anger, stress related to those things definitely can cause a lot of problems with them, physical problems yeah. and mental problems as well. Yeah. Well, and there was a time along the way in psychology where the, the understanding was that I need, to, I need to express it and get it out. And what they've discovered is it reinforces it. Yes. It was a great, uh, it's called the, the Bobo doll. If you know, remember those punching dolls? Yeah. So they had those and they would have, they did a study and they would let people punch, punch that. It. They found out that they didn't stop at the doll. They just got home and they were punching <laughs> <laughs> little sister. It's, little it's an adrenaline rush yeah, and that reinforces it, it, the behavior. Exactly. They actually did this in Japan where they thought that it would be good for people who were upset at their manager. So they would have that doll and put a picture of the manager on there, and so they would go in and, and punch it. That didn't work either. So imagine yeah. not. Yeah. I Career saw one, legit. Saw one in there with your picture on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm surprised it was standing. <laughs> it was deflated. I wanted no, to kidding. get to tit for tat. Uh, I, I believe that's what we were talking about: an eye for an eye, uh, a tooth for a tooth. Mm -hmm. 
the progression of this. I'm, I wanted you to talk briefly. I know Robin think I'm, I'm, I'm gone past my time. But uh, we talked a little bit about anger, but I want to apply that tit for tat and, and then with grace. Who wants to go when we're talking about tit for tat? I, I, th I think that people now, it's not an eye for an eye. It's uh, if, if, if you take an eye, I'm going to take your head off. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's exaggerated now. And I, I think it's because we have such a sense of entitlement. Okay, so, so w w you're saying it's gotten worse yeah, in our sinful worse. condition? I think so. That's, that's just my thought. What, your counselor, tell us, has it gotten worse to the people you see? Is that? Uh... Well, obviously it, 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 flow, it flows from a, a belief or notion that I have the right to necessarily take vengeance to, to, to get back, which is why forgiveness is actually putting down the sword and not getting back. That's, right. that's kind of what encompasses that. And of course, Paul over in, I want to say Romans 12, I believe, basically says, um, you know, uh, let God, that's God's business, let him take care of all of that. Uh, but, but tit for tat w was appropriate within the, within the confines of government. Government has some level of, of uh, privilege in doing that, but individually speaking, we're not given that privilege. It's not up to us to do that. That's up to God to take care of that. So, and uh, it, it's, it, you, in order to do that, you have to believe first and foremost that you have the license to do that. And well, Jesus is a, to do that. Yeah, yes. and Jesus is eliminating that license. I mean, that's that we don't have the license. Right. To he, he says, leave room for me. Yes. You don't have the right to do that. In fact, I, and that's one of the reasons I like the Beatitudes. It, it, it reminds us what, if, if someone pops you on this side, yeah, it, be humble enough to let them have the second. If someone takes you to court, do what? And sues you for your shirt, give them the cloak. Uh, the, the Roman mile. I mean, if you came up on the mile marker and the Roman soldier said, here, you hold this for a mile, you are to go the extra mile. Look at him, hey, sir, uh, I'll, I'll take this one more time for you. Mm -hmm. but, uh, because it had something to do with our faith, right? Well, it's not only going the extra mile, it's actually you have to do what he says. Right. See, that's the point. See, what Jesus is saying, uh -huh. you, that's, that's exactly what you have to do. The first mile is what you have no, to no, do. Everything he says is we have to do that. This is not, these aren't suggestions. Okay. These are have tos. That's why I say why Jesus is necessary. See, if I don't do that, that uh -huh. qualifies me for hell. If, if, I, if I call somebody a fool, that qualifies for me for hell. Uh -huh. If I don't go the extra mile, if I don't love my enemies, because from God's perspective, that's all there are. That's all there are. So, so I say I have to do that. Now, mm -hmm. right, if I don't, okay. I'm hellbound. I, I have to love perfectly. I have to love perfectly. Well, well, that's the point. point. Mm -hmm. All of these things uh -huh. are indwelt or caught up in that. Now, I, I want to I seek to love my enemy. I'm, 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 I, you know, Paul says in Titus, you know, uh, it, make every effort to do good things for your neighbor. Yeah. You know, but that, uh, again, I think there are entailments, and I think I I, I agree with your. But we start point. with them already having been met. That's my point. Yeah, they, that's they've that's already the, been met. To me, that's the right. greater righteousness right. because Christ has met them yeah. for me. I mean, He met them. I'm not and in debt. I'm, them I'm not me. in debt. I'm right. not behind. I don't have anything to and get. I'm not out in front. No, that, that's that's right. I'm 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 at the the finish line is the starting point. Right. Right, so and that's why, again, th this this passage is important in my view of how you look at it and what you're going to do with it, because it very easily becomes an outline for how I should be living my life. I, th I think I think the difference between your view and my view is that I accept your your premise, your first view. I I accept that, but then I expand this to think, well, if the Roman soldier asked me to, to go the mile, and I went the other mile. Again, it doesn't check a box. It's not an entrance requirement, but it's just being like Christ. It, it's, the, it's the product of being a Christian. Cross. Product. And I would just say consider the interests of others above your own, Philippians 2. A product. Thank you. All right.
we have uh, beat this horse. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, been going at it for how long? Probably about an hour, <laughs> 50 minutes. Uh, it's been fun, uh, challenging, and uh, very educational. And uh, I think I've grown a notch. I hope so. I, I hope so. Uh, Pastor, where are we going next week? Well, next week we're going to be talking about uh, chapter 6, and Jesus talks about, again, the emphasis on, is on the greater righteousness and the practice of the greater righteousness and how, you know, again, the righteousness of the, of the Pharisees doesn't cut it. Okay. All right. Yep. Good. How about closing this in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Father, I thank you for your word and, Lord, for how it, we read it and we can think about the context, we can think about the audience, we can think about, Lord, how it's been applied to the church through history, we can think about the analogy of Scripture, all of these wonderful things that are helpful to us, but most of all, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you teach us. Lord, the meaning and, Lord, how to live this out experimentally in our lives. I thank you for these men tonight. I, I thank you for Mike and for his leadership in this panel, uh, for Dan and for his ministry and for the insight that he's brought tonight. We thank you for Ken and for his ministry at the school and uh, with the students. And I just pray your blessings upon these men as they continue to serve you. And I pray for their families as well. And we look forward to the next time when we uh, discuss your word again together. In Christ's name, amen. amen.